all I really seek With the eyes inside my heart Is the smoke that's drifting up Over a sacrificed life All I really seek Is to see the fire fall As I answer to your call Living a sacrificed life And your neighbor, just like yourself Stay close to the Lord your God Don't let anyone steal the joy inside your heart Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're not going to read it this morning, but just look at one or two verses and see the pattern. Now, in, the, uh, in Matthew, we see uh, the Lord Jesus calling his disciples. In verse 1, And seeing the multitude, he went up into a, on a mountain, and when he was seated... His disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Now he teaches them in chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. That's what discipleship is. And he deals with the subjects that we're going to look at, such as prayer, the word of God, fellowship, witnessing, and obedience. Now when he comes to chapter 10... These are no longer disciples, but they are apostles. And we read in chapter 10, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits, and casting them out, and healed all kinds of sicknesses. Now the names of the twelve apostles, are the Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and, the, and Labius, the, whose surname was Theodorus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. A transformation takes place from chapter 5 to chapter 10. Now, what happened? These men, because of the teaching of Jesus, they were willing to lay down their lives for the gospel. And every one of them except John became a martyr. Every one of them laid down their lives, so impacted the message of Jesus on their lives that they were willing to die for him. Now, the Lord Jesus doesn't ask us to die for him today. He asks us to live for him. And so we're going to look at this very simple basics. And if we can grasp this, we can share with authority and assurance with other people the same truths that Jesus shared. Now, many Christians sometimes doubt their salvation. How can we overcome this problem? Well, our first lesson will be able to give us directions and guidance as to how 
we can know, we can be sure. Even those of us in later life who maybe are uh, getting forgetful or maybe in the circumstances of life that we lose some of our mental capacity. Is there an assurance? Is there something that we can cling on to? I used to visit a Pentecostal lady many years ago and uh, she said to me, John, am I really saved? And this was a godly woman with the fruit of the Spirit in her life and a sacrifice to give to the Lord's people. And I said to her, well, when did you come to know the Lord Jesus? She said, I trusted the Lord Jesus when I was a girl at a mission. And she mentioned the minister's name. I said, I notice you've got his picture on your sideboard there. Yes, she says, you know, I look at him and I remember the moment I trusted the Lord Jesus. But she said, sometimes I doubt. I said, I want you to do something. I wonder uh, when you doubt, you will turn Sam's face to the wall. But I want you to write on the back, though I cannot feel it, I believe it. Now, there were times when I would visit, and sometimes Sam's face would be to the wall, and sometimes he would face outward. I went to her funeral, glorious day, gone home, faithful servant of the Lord. And when I went into the room, I said to her daughter, where's the photograph of Sam? Oh, she says, there it is. And it was facing outwards. And I turned it round and she rubbed off. Though I cannot feel it, I believe it. You see, the principle of assurance of salvation is vital. Because when the way is tough, the way is difficult, when sorrow and pain and difficulty come, we have that assurance. Where do we get that assurance from? We get that assurance from the word of God. You've heard me say, and you probably will over this week, this is not black ink on white pages. This is the living Jesus. And he gives you and will give you the assurance of salvation. You believe his word. His word says so. His word will tell you. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. Not may or hope, you shall be saved. And your salvation rests on the promises of God's word that are unchangeable. Unchangeable. And then the second thing is that God's spirit will witness in your heart. The third Changes will take place. Fourth, you'll love your brothers and sisters. That's a difficult one. And we'll want to live godly lives. Now, in the epistle of John, it tells us about assurance of salvation. It says, I write to you, he's talking to young Christians, I write to you that believe on his name, that you have eternal life. Our salvation is based on, on the word of God, which is unchangeable. Men have attacked it for thousands of years, but it still stands. God's word is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. But you say, I came to trust the Lord Jesus when I was a, a young child. So did I. And I'm not sure exactly what I said or what I did. But I, I do know the Lord Jesus. But my problem is this. I often base my faith on my feelings. And when I base my faith on my feelings, sometimes I'm sure of being a Christian and sometimes not sure. And sometimes I'm not interested in what the word of God has to say. And sometimes I am. I am because my feelings fluctuate. Now, assurance of salvation is like a train. 
You have the carriages, you have the tender, as we call it, where the coal and the fuel goes, and then you have the engine. And so often we rely on our feelings, our circumstances, and our feelings fluctuate, and so sometimes we don't feel we're a Christian. And then sometimes our faith is strong, and sometimes it's very weak. But faith and feelings often change and often fluctuate. But the fact is this, that when I receive Jesus into my heart and into my life, I became his child and his Holy Spirit came to dwell within my heart. Now if you're talking to children about faith and feelings and facts. I like to put it like this. Three little men walking on the wall. Fact, faith, and feelings, they will never fall. But if I turn them round, feelings, faith, and fact, sometimes feelings can feel the wall, and he begins to fall. And so faith watches him, and his faith fail. But fact, he has no feelings, he has no faith. He either is on the wall or off the wall. And so I reverse and go fact, faith, and feelings. I will never fall. And so we need to trust God's unchangeable word. It's like a house. You must have a foundation. You must have walls and you must have a roof. To support the roof, you must have walls. Uh, uh, to support the walls, you must have a foundation. And our foundation is on the unchangeable word of God. And I saw it in my testimony last night and yesterday to establish in your mind, you can trust this book with your life. I set out without any visible means financially. And my God has met all my needs according to his riches and glory. It's not bad for a start, this big house, is it? Let alone the impact that God has made on the lives of young people and older. And so you can trust the unchangeable word of God. And then you come to the work of God's Holy Spirit. Now the scripture says God's Spirit witnesses or tells me in my heart that I belong to him as a child of God. Well, when the Spirit comes in, the Spirit brings Jesus to the human heart and I get that assurance because things happen in my life that didn't happen before. When the Holy Spirit comes... Suddenly, I get a desire to read God's word. But there is some discipline in there. But there is a desire and there will be a hunger to read God's word. Now, the presence of the Holy Spirit and the benefit is that I will suddenly become sensitive to sin. There were, be, there were things I did before I was converted that I no longer do. The things that I once loved... I now hate, and the things I once hated, I now love. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart. And then there is a desire to change my behavior, to be gone, begin to walk in the right path. I have true repentance turned my back on the world and its ways and my old ways and now I begin to walk with the Lord Jesus. And then I begin to understand God's word. God's word becomes something precious to me that I spend time with the word of God. And maybe this is why this Christian life is not giving you the joy and the blessing and the power in your life because you don't spend time with him. You see, we have idols in our lives. And those idols can be comfort, they can be marriage, boyfriend, girlfriend, children. They can be anything. And they're strange gods. And we bow and we worship at these altars. And if I called you idolaters and I called myself an idolater, you would be surprised 
But what is an idol? Anything that takes my energy, my money, and my time. That's what an idol is. And we're like Israel of old. Oh, it wasn't that they deserted Jehovah. It wasn't that they didn't want to worship Jehovah. They wanted to worship Jehovah, but they wanted to worship the other gods. And so, when the Holy Spirit begins to work in our life, he will change us. Our priorities will become different. And then changes would take place in our lives. We should be changing, as Wesley's hymn in Corinthians says, change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. How often are you and I changed this past year? If you cut a tree down, you can tell the year's growth. When the rings are there in that tree, you can see whether it's been a good year or a bad year for growth. And if we sliced in half today, how would last year? And maybe this year he's brought you here to challenge you afresh, to grow, to reach, reach out to what God has for you. Changes will take place. You'll experience a different attitude. Your, your habits will change. Instead of lying in bed, uh, you'll get out to read God's word in the morning. You'll have no Bible, no breakfast, and we'll look at that tomorrow. You'll have a desire. You see, uh, being a Christian is like sport. The more you train, the more energy you put in, the more preparation, the more successful you are going to be. But our problem is we worship at the altar of comfort and ease. And yet we want to be winners. We want to be winners. And if we want to be winners, you've got to put the time and energy in. Ah, until you say, like some of the runners that are preparing for the Olympics, I enjoy the discipline. And so, you will live different lives. You'll have different ideas and thinking and you'll have that desire to change. You see, the evidence is that I uh, am a Christian is I want to explore the book. Now, I can't understand how so many Christians go into church and talk before the preaching. And they don't even know where Hezekiah is in the Old Testament. By the way, there isn't a Hezekiah, so, you know. And we leave the word of God unneglected. And yet the word of God brings power, brings blessing, brings joy, brings comfort. I shared my testimony. You couldn't go any darker than those three tragic graves seemingly in Ireland, in a strange land, stoned and unwanted for all the joy of knowing Jesus and the power and the blessing that he brings and the gift he's given me in Joe that we might serve together. It's worth it all. Down here, never mind up there. It is worth it all when we see Jesus. And so, there'll be no Bible, there'll be no breakfast. We will uh, probably measure the amount of food that we eat as to the amount of time we spend in the word of God. You know it takes three hours to wash, dress, clean, do your hair, you know, uh, keep the body and soul together. I wonder how much time we spend in the word of God, in preparation of our hearts. And then the outlook will change. 
Our outlook will change to other people outside. When we meet them, the first thing we'll think about meeting them, not that they're fashionable clothes or, or they're clean or they're dirty. We'll see a soul that needs to be saved. We'll see them as an individual that's lost and without hope and that we have the answer to that need. And so it will motivate us to be hungry and have a desire to build a relationship. One of the major problems today in evangelism is we have events, we have services, rather than it being a lifestyle. So that each one you meet gives you an opportunity either to build relationships or to speak to them about the Lord Jesus. When you trust the Lord Jesus, your attitude to people, your attitude to your mother, your father, your brothers or sisters will be different. I wonder how many times you get angry with your mum, with your dad. I used to get angry with my mum. Nobody's ever seen me angry in this house. No one has ever seen. And if they ever did, you know, there'd be skin and hair and bones flying. But I used to get angry with my mum for silly reasons. You know what you are when you're a teenager, you know. And you look back. But I was in ministry at 14. I was preaching and teaching. I was doing what you're going to do this afternoon. And I had an old battered accordion, you know and some rollers of choruses, and I'd get on my bike, and I'd ride to the park and tell the kids about Jesus. <laughs> but sometimes I'd get mad with me mum. And I, would, I knew I was, should go out and tell the kids about Jesus, but I was mad with me mum, and I knew that the Lord couldn't bless me when I was still mad with me mum. And so I devised a brilliant Plan not to say sorry verbally. So what I used to do was I used to go out still angry with her out of the back door, write a note on a wee piece of paper. It wasn't spelt very well. I am sorry. Put it through the letterbox. Knock on the letterbox and run. You see, Changes should take place. But sometimes we're so arrogant, we're so proud, that we don't say sorry. God moved in my life when I was a young man of about 26 years of age. And he moved through an outreach ministry called Project Evangelism, Merlock House. And you know, God spoke through this um, South African evangelist called Kent Hoven. And do you know what happened? God spoke to us about brokenness and yieldedness. There were young people queuing up, standing in line at the telephone to ring their parents to say they were sorry. Changes take place in our lives. How are you changing? Change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. And then we will love our brothers and sisters. Oh, man. Isn't it great to love them? Some people are lovely lovers, aren't they? And some of them, Lord, help us. You know? But what does the Bible teach us about those difficult people? It says, and I think Jesus is brilliant. I know he was the son of God, but I still think he's brilliant. He said in the authorized version, which doesn't come out in any other version, that if there's anyone you don't like or you've fallen out with, you're to heap coals of kindness on their head. Now let's split the text up. Isn't that what you like to do? You'd like to burn them. You'd like to sap them. Coals, he says. Tip it on their heads. But he says, coals of kindness. And so 
Some people are hard to love. I have a method that I use that if anyone should fall out with me, not always, not every time, but if God lays upon my heart that I go and I seek a relationship and a friendship with that third person. You see, an enemy makes a better friend than he does an enemy. And if we feed the enemy and the attitude to that enemy or the person we don't like, it will spoil us. But if you take the time to pray and to go for a coffee, go for a meal, or it might not be a buddy-buddy friendship, but you've been obedient to God's word. And isn't that what it's all about? How much joy you get when you arrived here because you were obedient to God's call to Ireland. And you sensed that the Lord wanted you here. And when we're obedient to God's word, the wonder of it all is that he blesses us and we know a real joy that's unshakable, that's unquestionable, whatever the circumstances. And so we've got to love our brothers and sisters. Even though they may be unlovable, we must love them. And then the fifth mark of a Christian is we'll want to share the Savior with others. I believe that our lives should be a constant searching and looking for people to speak about. I step out of my comfort zone. The person I meet in the supermarket will be a person that I might reach his whole family. And God brings people into our lives in the supermarket, in, in our day, daily living, in our school, in our work, in our play. And he brings us in contact. And we should ever be looking for opportunities. Not that we shove it down their throat, but that we build a relationship and a, a friendship. Now, why does it need to be a friendship? Well, you see, the gospel wounds the gospel wounds. It either, uh, the gospel will either make you mad, sad, or glad. One or, the, one or the other. It'll make you mad because you've been wrong all the days of your life. That's what I'm saying to the unconverted. You've been wrong all the days of your life. If you say that to a Muslim or to other religions, it's a hard thing to admit that you've been wrong all the days of your life. It'll either make you mad or sad. Sad that you're not willing to pay the price, you're not willing to trust, you're not, not willing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be saved. Or it'll make you glad you accept him. Now the scripture says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Now if my gospel is going to wound someone and either make them mad, sad, or glad, Especially if it makes them mad. That's the end of my friendship. That's the end of my conversation. That's my on the end of my relationship. But if they are my friend, and they like being with me, maybe ulterior motives, but they like being with me, and I like being with them, then you can continue and share the gospel. Because you're friends. And then you've got that friendship and that relationship that when they trust the Lord Jesus, you disciple them. How many of you have got a disciple? You need a disciple. Why do you need a disciple? Because it'll keep you on your metal. Because it, you'll say to them, no Bible, no breakfast. And one day they'll come up to you and they'll say, hey, what did you read this morning? 
or what's God been saying to you this morning? You know, young converts, uh, they ask difficult questions. And so you need a disciple. Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, this young man, and he says, young man, don't let anybody despise your youth. Take a little wine for your stomach's sake because you have your nerves and your tension when you get up to preach. But commit thou to faithful men that they may teach others also. And we need to commit what we know to other people that they might grow. Now some Christians don't want to grow. Some Christians are I've counted the cost, and all they want is an insurance policy to heaven and a, and a pass to the fire escape. But there are those that want to grow. And so we will want to share our faith with others. We will want to disciple others as well. And then lastly, and you're listening so well this morning, we want to live godly lives. What's the evidence that we want to live godly lives? Well, we've looked at some of those. But there'll be a hunger in your heart to get to know God. There'll be a hunger in your heart to get to know the word of God. There'll be desire to share your faith with others. And you will be expecting Jesus to come back for you. Because that's the greatest motivator. When I was a little lad, and now, I love sweets. I love candies. And my mum was a very strange mum. She'd lock the candies in the cupboard. I mean, what sort of a woman would lock candies in a cupboard? <laughs> But I knew where the key was. <laughs> and so she goes out and I give her 15 minutes to get down the road. I get the chair. I get the key. I open the cupboard door. I've got my hand in the candy jar. And the back door opens. What you do? Now you've got to think quick if you're going to get away with it. <laughs> and my hand was still in the candy jar and I looked at her and I said, Mommy, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Not a flicker or a change of expression on her face. I thought, let's try her again. I said, Mommy... I love you. And then I added, but I wish he hadn't come back so soon. <laughs> you know he's coming back. Maybe we'll say, Lord, I wish he hadn't come back so soon. We need to live godly lives. There should be that hunger, that desire. I know the world draws. I know the flesh is there, this self-nature that wants to be predominant and rule. But for the joy that he brings and the power and the blessing and the planning. I refer to my testimony again. I would not have it any different for the blessing he's brought out of seeming tragedy and difficulty. And oh, the joy of knowing him for 65 years and knowing that he's kept his word and I can trust him in a fast-changing world where there is nowhere we can find ground to stand and be sure of anything.
And so I trust this morning, as we've looked briefly at the uh, six marks of a Christian, the assurance of salvation, God's word says so. The Holy Spirit testifies and witnesses in my heart. And my heart witnesses with the Holy Spirit that I belong to him. Changes keep on taking place even as I get older. We love our brothers and sisters, which are sometimes difficult to do, and we want to share our faith with with others and we want to live godly lives and so I trust this morning these very simple principles will generate in our hearts a hunger and a desire to know him Paul cried oh that I might know him and the power of his resurrection are you hungry I trust so. Father, we thank you for these precious moments. And we pray that you will just teach us by your Holy Spirit some of the things we know so well, some of the things are gone and need to be renewed with confession and repentance and seeking to know you and to see changes continually taking place in our lives. Oh, Lord, you make it true in my life. Teach us to be hungry after you. We pray in Jesus' name.